very best is challenging. But when you add the difficulties of life to it, it becomes even more so a challenge. I, want, I, I was hoping that Trinley was going to be here this morning. Uh, she and I have become good chat buddies on, online, and uh, I was hoping that she was going to be here this morning to help me with an illustration. But since she's not, I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to find another volunteer to help me with a little thing this morning. Let's see. Who's going to be my volunteer today? I think Beverly Preparers needs to be my volunteer. Come here, Beverly. <laughs> Beverly looks like she would be the she would be the perfect choice for. I just need you over here, Beverly, and I want you to help me do something this morning, okay? I'm I'm going to drive this nail in this board, but I need for you to hold the nail. Oh gosh. Ooh. Okay. Whoa. Wait a minute. Oh. No. Oh no, Steve. You don't trust me? No, I don't know. <laughs> but common sense says don't do that, right? No. Okay. <laughs> you know what? I would really kind of hope that she'd just drop the nail and run, but she didn't do that. Uh, I know Trinley probably would have. Um, three things come together in that little illustration that are important to us. For us to understand today that these events happen. This hammer may not have hurt so bad, but that big hammer would have hurt a lot. Have you ever hit your thumb with a hammer? The three things that come together that need to underlie what we're talking about today is this. I asked her, do you trust me? And she said, yes, but not really. The look on her face said, I trust you because that's the answer I'm supposed to give, but I really don't want you to swing that hammer. The second thing that came to play here was fear. As long as she didn't know what was coming, as long as she looked at that little hammer, she wasn't quite as, as upset as when I brought out that, that sledgehammer. And all of a sudden, the fear of what? What did she fear? Pain. It wasn't that, it wasn't that we couldn't do the task. It wasn't that we couldn't drive the nail. That would have been this fear of being hit with that hammer that would, have, that would have caused that. The other thing I want to say to you is the unexpected nature of that. I didn't call Beverly this morning and say, hey, will you help me with an illustration? And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pull out a big old sledgehammer and pretend to hit that hit nail with a sledgehammer. She was caught totally and completely off guard. She didn't have a chance to say no. She could have, but probably wouldn't have. She was caught in a situation that she just didn't really ask for. She didn't create it. She didn't perpetrate it on herself. She just got caught in a situation. And the interesting thing about Beverly is she stood there, even though the nail was going like this, she kept thinking, are you serious? Are you real? Please don't swing that sledgehammer. Keep those three concepts in mind as we look to Job chapter 2. The interesting thing about Job is that he repeats what he said in, in chapter 1. So those of you that were with us last week or tuned in with us know the story of chapter 1. <clears throat> when the Benai Elohim in the Hebrew, the sons of God, came to present themselves before the Lord. So let's read that. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also come among them to present himself before the Lord. Please understand that at this point in history, the Benai Elohim included one called Satan. The sons of God included one called Satan. He had access to heaven. He had access to God. He had access to God's ear. He could have conversation with, with, with God. He could talk to God. God asked him questions. The Lord said to Satan, where have you been? Where have you come from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about the earth and walking around on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? That's a strange question <clears throat> coming after the, the statement that Satan makes, from roaming about on the earth and walking around it. The idea here, or the innuendo here, is that Satan has been walking around on the face of the earth, but with a purpose. My purpose, Satan would have said, if given the opportunity, 
is to say to you that this creation of man has been a total failure. That I can't find any really good people on the face of the earth. And in the midst of that, God says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man fearing God and turning away from evil. And he still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to ruin him without cause. In chapter 1, we know that all of his cattle was taken away. We know that his children were taken away. We know that his property had been destroyed. Everything about Job had come to a, a, a collapse in his life. <clears throat> his whole world had fallen apart. And, and now God is saying to Satan, uh, he's still holding fast. You still haven't, there's not enough that's happened in his life yet that has caused him to turn from me. Now think about that for a moment. Everything in Job's life had collapsed. Everything of significance had been taken away from him. And yet he still held fast to his integrity. Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, yes. All that a man has will give all that a man has, he will give for his life. However, put forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he will curse you to your face. Now understand the transition that's taken away from there. <clears throat> the, the pain that had come upon Job to this point was, was stuff. You might say his children was a little bit closer to that, but the idea was Satan said, but you haven't touched him yet. If, if you were to touch him, if you were to take away his health, if you were to make life painful for him, he will curse you to your face. And so the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your power, power only spare his life. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. For someone who has had a single boil and knows what that is all about. I can only imagine the pain. Boils from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head. And he took a pot shared and scraped himself while he was sitting among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. What a wonderful wife. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversary, uh, adversity? Now understand what just, just understand Job's concept. We can't just get good from God all the time. There's going to be some, there's going to be some adversity. We can't just accept only the good from God, but we also must accept the not so good. And all this Job did not sin with his lips. Now when Job's three friends heard of all the adversity that had come upon him, they came each one from their own place. Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuite, and Zophar, the Namanite. And they made an appointment together to come and sympathize with him and comfort him. And when they lifted up their eyes at a distance and did not recognize him, they raised their voices and wept. And each of them tore his robe and they, drew dust over their, they threw dust over their heads toward the sky. And they sat down on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights, and no one speaking a word to him. For they saw that his pain was very great. <clears throat> Where do we go with this? Last week we talked about when our world collapsed, but what happens when the pain goes even beyond that? <clears throat> what happens when the difficult moments of life become painful, personal experiences? I want us to say something about Satan there, and, and uh, you, can, you, can, you can approach this however you want to theologically. <clears throat> Many believe that there is a personification of evil that takes place, and Satan is the name of that, of that evil. Whether you believe in a Satan that's alive and well and living among you or whether you believe that evil runs rampant in our lives, it doesn't really matter. The bottom line is still the same. 
There is a part of life that is considered not good. There's a part of life that's evil. There's a part of life that's roaming the earth specifically looking for trouble, specifically looking to make life difficult for you. <clears throat> now understand this, this story about Job. It's, it's essential that you understand this, that God had removed his protection around Job. That God has said to, to Satan, you can do anything except you can't touch his life. And later on, Satan comes back and says, but if you give me control of his personal being, he will be so painful that he will curse you to his face. He will, he will look you in the eye and curse you. Now, I want you to understand the, the, the pain that must have been there to bring Job to that part of his life. I want to go to another place in the New Testament and draw an analogy there also. There was a man of Gerizim, it says, that when Jesus crossed the lake, the man of Gerizim was so out of control that they had pushed him outside into the catacombs, the grave area. They had bound him up. They had chained him. <clears throat> he did harm to himself, and others had done harm to him. And I think this, this, this is a, a great illustration of what I want to say to you. That Jesus gets out of the boat and begins walking towards this man. And what is it that he says? Have you come to torment me too? Have you come to add to my pain? The Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior. Everyone else is crying out to him, save me, heal me. Give sight back to my, my eyes. Everyone else that recognized Jesus saw him as someone who could change their painful situation, but this man had, point, had passed the point of no return. I hurt so badly that I can't even see hope in the Son of God. I can't even see hope in the Messiah. I can't even see hope in the one who is able to take the pain away from anyone. Do you understand that, that there's that limit? There's that moment that I'm talking about. There's that part of life that's there. It's roaming the earth. It's looking for trouble. How does it attack us? <clears throat> it attacks us first and foremost physically. It attacks our body. And then it begins to challenge our patience. And then it begins to challenge our faith. And then it begins to challenge our integrity. And then it begins to challenge everything about us that has become the foundational parts of our lives. Satan's damage to Job left him with sores all over his body and a wife who doubted him. The painful moment had come for Job. He was scraping the sores, hoping to make them better. His friends arrive, and they, they see him, and they look at him, and they what? They don't even recognize him. They understood his pain. And they sat with him for seven days and seven nights, never saying a word. One of my first pastoral experiences in Orangeburg involved a young lady who had two children. The two children were involved in our church. One of the boys played basketball for our church basketball team. His younger sister was as priceless as could be. And mom had been complaining about a headache. The headache ended up being an aneurysm that ruptured. For seven nights and seven days, we sat in a waiting room at Richland Memorial Hospital. Thomas Rickenbaker is a friend of mine. His son, Tommy, played basketball for me. We, we, we sat there in a waiting room. I did not leave the hospital for seven days and seven nights because this mother, age 30-something, was in this terrible situation. His brother was there. Some family members would come and go. But many times in the night, in the early morning hours, 
no one would say a word. We can see the pain in his eyes. To say to him, how are you doing, would have almost seemed frivolous. We encouraged him to eat. We encouraged him to drink. We encouraged him to to go away for a while, go somewhere else, get away from this particular moment in time. And yet the pain was so overbearing that oftentimes we just sat and looked at each other. That's what I want to describe to you today. I don't know that any of you are there or I don't know that any of you will ever go there. I don't know that any of us will have the kind of pain that Job suffered, but pain is a part of life. It is something that sometimes unexpectedly becomes a part of our lives. There's a physical pain, and let's talk about that for a moment. His sores, he scraped his sores. He could not find relief from the pain and the itching. Um, I, ha- I had a boil one time on the back of my neck, and it was the most painful thing. The collar of my shirt would rub against it, and it was constant pain. I hated it. I went to the doctor, and he said, well, I can fix that, and he lanced it. And, 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 and in a couple of days, it had, it had healed itself, and the pain had gone away. But for those hours, no sleeping, every time you'd roll over, every time you'd put a shirt on, every time you'd turn your neck, there was that striking pain. Can you imagine being covered with sores from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head and constantly in pain? Maybe you've been there. Maybe you've had something that has caused that kind of difficulty. And we live in a day and age where we can take a pill and we can alleviate our pain. We live in a day and age where we can go to the doctor and the doctor can say, take this when it hurts. Take this every three hours. Take this every six hours. If you can't sleep at night, take one of these. And even in the moments of life when pain becomes unbearable, we can usually put people out of their physical pain. But what about mental pain? What about that that stress of not understanding why this is happening to you? What about that stress of, of wondering what other people are going to think about what's happening in your life? Many people assumed in Job's day that he had sinned against God. Now, I want to say something to you. Up until this point, Job has not sinned. Job chapter 1 tells us he was blameless before God. He was righteous. God looked at him and said, here is one human being that I can bring out of the the, the surface that I think is a good guy. He's lived up to what I want him to be. It's not what Job did that caused sin. It was the attitude that Job approached it that caused sin. You see, we often talk about sin as being the things that we do. And we often think that a person who's suffering in life, for some reason, has done something to God, and God, in turn, is trying to get even with them. The circumstances of life and the evil wave hits us, and all of a sudden we're in these very traumatic times, and the first thing that people want to say to us is, what have you done to God that has caused God to do this to you? Over and over and over and over again, Job's three friends kept saying, you might as well just go ahead and admit it, Job. You might as well just go ahead and say that you've done something and God is getting you. I appreciate John Leitner. I appreciate what he said just a few moments ago. That in those moments when we think that God's out to get us, we need to be reminded of his reckless love. There's no mountain that he won't climb. There's no shadow he won't dispel. There's no lie that he won't get rid of coming after us. Why? Because his intent is to love us, not to hurt us. The pain that comes, whether it's you making an unco- making a choice and facing the consequences of it, or whether it's just the evil in the world that we live that causes the pain, it's not God who says, I'm going to get you. Where did Job sin? Job's sin comes as when he begins to say something like this to his friends. 
Now, with friends like this, you really didn't need enemies. You know, these guys sit around there, and they just, they were just, and they were, they were saying those things that I heard people say to people who were hurting over and over again, and I just wish that they would be quiet. Sometimes we need to not say anything, because what we say brings more pain. It's when Job began to say things like this. If if God were here today, if God were standing face to face with me, if God were looking me in the eye, God would have to say, I've done nothing to deserve this pain, their sin. Sin is when Job put himself on equal level with God to say, I can look God in the eye and I will be right and God will be wrong. see, the damage that Satan had caused was severe. It was difficult. But what did the scripture say? He was still standing faithful. Even his wife. Why don't you just curse God and die? <laughs> this is so bad. Why don't you just go ahead and put yourself out of, mer- out, out of, out of this terrible situation? It would be merciful to you if you just went ahead and let God kill you. Do you see how, do you see to the extent that this has gone? That cursing God and dying is a better option than where you are. Myrtle James was 96 years old. Myrtle James was in my second church that I pastored, First Baptist Church, Bishopville. Myrtle James was a wealthy lady because all that she and her three sisters had all bought Sunoco stock when it was at 50 cents a share. And when the Sunoco stock just skyrocketed, all four of those single women became extremely wealthy in their own sight. Three of the sisters had died and left their wealth to Myrtle. So Myrtle had been the recipient of all of this great wealth as she was 96 years old. Do you know what she did? She took care of a little family that lived on a piece of property that she owned. That was her calling in life. She loved the children that would come by, and so she paid someone to put a a basketball goal in her driveway so that the children would come and play basketball as she would roll out in her wheelchair and shoot baskets with them. 96 years old, in a wheelchair, playing basketball. That's kind of like, go ahead and swing the hammer. She fell out of her wheelchair, shooting a three-pointer, broke her hip. They took her to the hospital, and of course they called and said, Myrtle's in the hospital, you need to go see her. And so I, I, I got off the elevator, and I could, hear, I could hear Myrtle down the hall. Oh! I thought, surely that's not her. But the closer I got to the room, the more the groaning became, and it was more intense. Oh! And I opened the door, and I went in, and, and, and I, I realized, oh, my God, she's hurting. <laughs> now, it wasn't... Will you go get a nurse? Will you find me some pain medication? She looked me in the eye and she said, Pastor Steve, will you pray that I just go ahead and die? I said, Myrtle, I can't pray that prayer. And she said, well, if you can't help, go on home. (laughs) And and that was Myrtle. I think she was pretty serious. She just wanted me to pray that she'd just go ahead and die. Have you ever been to the place in your life where just leaving it all has got to be better than where I am. But listen to Job's persistence. Even his wife said, why don't you take an easy way out, Job? His friends kept saying to him, what have you done? The emotions of the situation did not change Job. The logic that all of his friends were giving him didn't change Job. Job began to understand that this is Something that I can't get a hold of. But he realized 
that his God was still in control. Even to the moment he sins, he still believes that God is in control. Even in the midst of the severe pain, even in the midst of wanting to die, <clears throat> even in the midst of all of this that had been dumped on poor old brother Job, his answer over and over and over again is God is still in control. He was consistent. He was not trying to be a godly man like everyone else. <clears throat> he was just being consistent in what he believed and what he understood. I can't think of the pain that maybe people have gone through. I had a very difficult time changing my clock back on daylight savings day. I did not want to give 2020 even one more hour. 2020 has been a rough, rough year for a lot of people. It may have come home to you, I don't know. But there's been a lot of people in our country who have hurt. Much like World War II, much like the Vietnam conflict, much like other difficult moments that we've been in the history of our country, the Civil War, the tragedy, the hurt, the pain, the suffering, the mental stress, the physical stress, the emotional stress. <clears throat> and yet those who have made it through those are people who said, we still believe that when this is all over, when everything is finalized, when the pain will be no more, that our God is still sitting on his My friend Michael Crawford and his wife Kay were two of the most talented people that I know. Kay was a concert pianist. She was probably one of the best pianists I've ever heard in my life. I haven't heard a lot of them, but she was good. Michael enjoyed the arts. He enjoyed drama. He enjoyed doing plays. He enjoyed making sets. He, enjoyed, he directed all of these <clears throat> all of these musicals and all of these plays that would be put on in what was called Orangeburg Part-Time Players. It began with just a few people that gathered together and said, hey, we want to do some dramatic things in Orangeburg. <clears throat> they bought a theater, and, and once a year and sometimes twice a year, they would put on a production, and we would all go and enjoy the production. Michael physically got to the place where that was not an easy thing to do anymore. Part of the pain in his life, he told me once, was not his body that was hurting, but it was inability to do the things that he enjoyed and loved. And yesterday, I, I did like I normally do at a funeral. I got to the place where I said, I don't know what's going on in heaven. If you've been to one of my funerals, you've heard me say this. But I'd like to give you an image of what I think might be happening in heaven. And before I could get it out of my mouth, the oldest daughter said, they're putting on a play. That's exactly what I was going to say. That they, were, that, they were, that they were running the bills, that they were getting the tickets ready. <clears throat> they were doing the props. They were getting it all ready. And they were starting to sell tickets. Now, I also assumed them that I didn't want my ticket today, but that if any of them wanted to buy their ticket, they could do that. But that, that, that what they enjoyed most in life is what the image of heaven is for them. Listen to me, folks. The pain that comes here can rob us of the things that we enjoy most. What is it that God gives us when we reach eternity? the things we enjoyed most. At the end of Job, what does he give him? He gives him his donkeys back. He gives him his sheep. He gives him his children. <clears throat> All the things that were important to Job's life were restored to him. Now, whether you think that there's children that can replace children that are gone, all, that, all those questions that get raised, here's the image that we're supposed to have. What Job lost 
what Job went through was restored. Sin brings pain. It brings sorrow. It brings difficult moments. We have to get through this life. <clears throat> we have to get from birth to death. And folks, that is just one painful experience after the next. But for those of us who enjoy our faith in Christ, for those of us who look into eternity, we realize that one day the pain will be no more. That's the very first thing that John says when he sees heaven. Hey, they're not crying there. They're not hurting there. The pain has gone away. There's no more sorrow. There's no more death. And John says to us, when we get there, it is the enjoyment of life that God has given freely. God's not out to get you. God doesn't want you to curse him and die. God wants you to hold on to hope. Be faithful to the very end. Because that which you desire the most are the things that he will give us in eternity. I hope one day to play baseball in heaven. I enjoy playing baseball. I hope that we'll play a game that we'll never lose. That's hard to do because if you've got two teams, somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. So I think what happens there, the score just keeps flip-flopping back and forth and you just keep playing and playing and playing and playing. Because it's the game that matters. It's the enjoyment. It's not the win or the loss that makes all the difference in the world. I want to make one final statement today in light of winning and losing. Winning and losing is not the inevitable end. Whether your side won or your side lost doesn't really matter. What matters is how we played the game. What matters is did we maintain our integrity in living our life. It doesn't matter whether someone is right or someone is wrong. <clears throat> it's a matter how you deal with the people who see it differently than you do. Oh, Job's friends wanted him to curse God and die. But Job said, I just can't see it that way, guys. My integrity will not allow me to do that. Dear Father, we pray that you would remind us today that life does have pain. It has those unreliable moments that come our way, that Satan or that evil or whatever it is that comes upon us <clears throat> brings great sorrow and hurt. And in the midst of our pain, we pray that you would give us hope. That at the end of it all, even though we've sinned, even though we've faltered, even though we've faced difficult moments, that we have maintained our faith in you and that you're still sitting on your throne and you're still saying, welcome home, my child. We hope that you would teach us from Job that it wasn't his patience that was so good. It was his hope and faith. For we pray it in Christ's name and for his sake.